Welcome to the Caffeine Podcast, specially brewed for Kiwi startup founders. I'm Fiona Rotherham from Caffeine, which is a community hub for Kiwi startup founders. Kicking off the Caffeine Podcast is a series Seed to Success, about building and backing Kiwi startups, and it's brought to you by New Zealand Growth Capital Partners. The series showcases Kiwi startups with potential for high growth across different sectors, giving insights on what it takes to build a successful company from New Zealand and just how much of a hard slog it can be. We're talking today with Ratu Matara, the founder of OpenStar Technologies, which is the first Kiwi company to start building a fusion reactor with the aim of mitigating climate change through clean energy. Outset Ventures partner Angus Blair has called OpenStar undoubtedly the most ambitious startup to come out of New Zealand. And joining Ratu today is Professor Rod Badcock, Deputy Director at the Robertson Research Institute, where Ratu did his PhD, and Byron Van Voot, who is the Investment Manager at New Zealand Growth Capital Partners, whose Aspire Seed Fund is one of the investors in OpenStar, as well as the backers of this podcast. So kia ora to you all. Can I get all of you to just give a short elevator pitch about yourselves in addition to what I've said? So perhaps starting with you, Byron. Yeah, morning, Fiona, and thanks for having me here today. Um, my background prior to joining the Aspire Seed Fund was in mechanical engineering, where I really got quite interested in how engineering's done and systems thinking. Having studied finance and marketing alongside that, um, I'm now blending all three skill sets to understand how technology or new technology works and what market potential that has. Great. And what about you, Rod? Kia ora. So I've... Uh had an interesting background. It's uh, not been a path that's always been in superconductivity and it's a mixed background that compasses uh, uh, industry and, and academia and even startup um, that we've done in a variety of technologies. And I suppose the Institute here uh, is focused on mission-oriented, commercially applicable research and that's about mission, research with a purpose that uh, and taking it through to that application, and I think you know we're incredibly proud of what uh, Ratu's going out and doing. And Ratu, tell us a bit about yourself. <laughs> um, these days, it's pretty hard to untangle my personal biography from the fact that I'm running something like OpenStar. Um, but I completed my PhD in applied superconductivity, uh, not just at the Institute Rod was a um, deputy director of, but Rod was um, one of my supervisors um, much more directly. Um, And during my PhD, just really focused on how technologies could be used to solve uh, real problems that are in front of us right now, in particular climate change. So that work was actually focused on a hybrid electric aircraft. So whether or not we can make a, a a Prius that can actually fly. Um, And it turns out, I think that technology is in really good hands with uh, Robinson, and it turns out that there's this other thing, the levitated dipole, um, that no one was going to pick up unless uh, OpenStar um, was born and took it on upon ourselves. Um, And so that's really led into what I'm doing now. So can you talk about your Eureka moment, if you like, like when you first sort of thought, hey, there's something in this? Um, I think a lot of people uh, poo-poo the idea of a solution looking for a problem. Um, I think that happens all the time. I think really good work solves problems and then you uh, create solutions and then you need to go find the problem where that solution uh, actually delivers the most value. Um, So in my case, it was the superconducting power supplies that I had been studying in my PhD and also getting familiar with a broader technology as well, not just a kind of supply I was working on. Um, And it could solve all sorts of problems. Like I said, we were working on hybrid electric aircraft, but the real question was, what's the problem that is uniquely suited to be solved? Is there a commercialization pathway with that problem? I'll give you an example that for electric aircraft, the commercialization pathway is probably not a startup. It's probably companies like Boeing and Airbus integrating that technology because you don't want to have to reinvent the plane just to uh, turn it into uh, an electric powertrain. So you should work with existing aerospace companies to do that. Um, The difference with a fusion reactor is that there isn't a big uh, institutional fusion reactor goliath that's already building these machines and we're just trying to commercialize a new widget that's going to make it better. Um, fusion companies, fusion industry will need to be built from scratch. Um, and so 
finding that problem and realizing that there is a commercialization pathway is what really uh, piqued my interest. Um, and so that eureka moment itself was really that. I was having dinner with a friend of mine who had just done his master's degree in fusion physics, and he was just listing out all the different ways you can build fusion reactors, all the different arrangements of uh, whether or not you use magnets or lasers or um, what shapes you use. And he mentioned one that I had never heard of before, uh, the levitated dipole. Um, and I was reasonably impressed that I'd never heard of it. Um, and then when I dug into it, I kind of, yeah, no one's heard of this thing. Um, only a few of them were ever built. Um, but it involved levitating a magnet and disconnecting it from all of its power supplies and cryogenic systems and support systems. And so the whole community had basically just decided that these things were um, entirely impractical or Im impossible to actually engineer. Um, but those problems were exactly what we had been solving at Robinson um, in the case of aircraft. And so that eureka moment was, oh, I bet everybody else thinks this is crazy. Um, but the reason they think it is crazy is actually a problem that we've already solved. And if you can get past that, then the question is, is this a useful thing to actually build? Are levitated dipoles a better kind of fusion reactor? Um, and that was, to my surprise, kind of post-eureka moment, um, that, yeah, we should absolutely be building levitated dipoles. And so OpenStar was born. Can you describe for me how this technology will actually work? And obviously I don't have a PhD, so, so maybe use it in layman's terms, but, but what are you, what are you, what are you th hoping we'll do once you build this reactor? So the general promise of fusion, no matter kind of what the approach is, is that we can build uh, power plants where the fuel is no longer really an input consideration. So if I want to make energy, I'm not worried about the cost of fuel anymore. You still have a large capital cost, so you're spending a lot of money on equipment. And so if you're taking a financial view, you can there are pros and cons to that, and you, know, you still do the economics. But the fact that it doesn't involve a fuel cost is a huge bonus. Um, and then really importantly, it's not a carbon-based fuel. So as you um, produce energy, you're not creating CO2. So that's the um, broad promise is that we can build machines that once they're built, aren't limited by our ability to go and find something to keep them running. They just do their job and give us energy and they give it to us in a reliable baseload fashion. Um, then when you go into the particular approaches to fusion, uh, the kinds of machines that you want to build, um, you have different advantages, disadvantages, to proposed, um, and in the case of a levitated dipole that we want to build, these machines end up being quite large. And so you want to, in the power plant sense, we're not talking like a wind turbine in the backyard of your home or a solar panel on your roof. We're talking about a power plant that is probably of a similar scale to the kind of coal fire power plants that we've already built. Um, but that's actually what our grid needs. That's the additional tool in the toolkit that we want to add um, as a way of um, retiring those coal plants without foregoing the uh, grid that we've built around them. I said at the start that it's ambitious. What's, what's your um, likelihood of success? <laughs> um, uh, in financial terms, like if you look at the valuation of OpenStar and you know, the, the investors are clearly making some kind of uh, payoff uh, trade-off, and then you think, well, if OpenStar is successful, we're probably building a trillion dollar uh, global energy um, uh, enterprise, then I think the financial prediction of success is much lower than the real chance of success. Um, this is something that you'll find with founders in general, is that we're usually much more optimistic about our enterprises than our investors are, because our investors watch a whole bunch of their investments fail, but like every founder needs to believe um, that their approach is actually going to work. Someone asked me a good question the other day, which was, do I believe it more or less now that I'm kind of two years uh, into building this thing? Um, and I believe it more. So every day that we think about this more, we come across problems, we solve them, and we get a better resolution on what we're trying to build, um, our confidence increases. Um, so I think our, our chances are only improving, um, and it's well worth the amount of time, effort, and resource uh, that, that we're putting into it. The, the payoff is just huge. So one of the things I wanted to discuss is I understand you've been able to attract really top talent to the company. Um, why are people coming? What, what's the motivation for them? Is it the mission? Yeah, um, startups always need a good mission. Um, and I would say that the nice thing about picking a really hard problem in general um, is it attracts really talented people because talented people like working on hard things. 
Um, then there's the coolness aspect of it. Like, it's really cool tech. You know, your day-to-day problem solving, the things that you're building and interacting with and your colleagues that you're working with um, are all just doing amazing stuff. And so you get to be in an environment like that. Um, but the really unique thing is the combination of uh, probably difficulty, how cool it is, but then on top of that, that it is actually the mission of our generation. Um, I think if I had been born 40 years ago, let's say, I would have been much more interested in um, quantum gravity or building quantum computers or you know launching rockets into space. But for my generation, um, solving climate change is the thing we need to do, even if we found some other stuff more interesting. And that motivation is pulling talented people out of some of those other areas uh, to work on fusion instead, um, which I think is the correct choice. It's the responsible thing to do, frankly. So, Rod, um, when you sort of first um, looked at this idea, what was what was your, what was your feeling about it? Uh, the first time when uh, Ratu Ratu said about doing it, it's um, well, LDX was successful. Uh, sorry, um, LDX is the MIT experiment that um, uh, is the basis of the levitator dipole, and so I I thought, well, fusion's hard, right? Fusion. Energy is a hard problem. There's a lot of technology and other parts in there. But does is this a key to open it? Absolutely. But uh, I suppose for me, I have a slightly different take on uh, where Ratu... You asked Ratu the question, you know, was what it, will he succeed? Yeah? Fusion energy will succeed, right? And will Ratu and his team be part of the solution to making that right? They'll be financial benefit there will be a win even even if he doesn't pass some of his stages or whatever because it will move on and the reason for that is it's a motivated team doing an exciting challenging problem where they're already eating away milestones they're they're targeted and focused on it so what did i think when he said it i thought it's a hard problem but but i knew ratu right and uh, there's a lot about the individuals involved and the way they think about the problem so he hadn't said, oh, look, I just, it's really exciting and doing it. He says, I'm going to do it because of this. And I fought through, and this allows that to happen. Now that means that I could, we can do this, and that is what they were missing. Um, and so the first time he said it, it's sort of like, you're going to do fusion in New Zealand? <laughs> my, first thing, my first thing was, will, what will the government say with uh, some of our treaties and other things? And actually, I think the government are supportive. I think the whole country is supportive. It's sustainable, almost limitless, clean energy is what they're focused on. It hasn't got the nastiness. And it's sort of like it's a great goal, but there are so many spillover opportunities that will, will, will come through and out of what they're doing. And so for me, it was a no-brainer. It's because even if you don't initiate the full fusion machine here in New Zealand and, and start producing them out of here, you're going to have so many uh, technologies and systems that go into so many other places. So that it feeds back to some of, our, uh, some of my work on the aviation. You know, I watch with interest because the problems being solved feed back and they're helping to solve other problems. It solves other things are the way, uh, you know, it, it's going to solve even healthcare with MR systems. So I look at it and it's, it's a no-brainer. I'm, I'm, I'm hardly surprised that uh, uh, Outset really wanted to drive this forward. I just wanted to touch on Robinson. So it's the country's premier um, research institute for superconducting magnetic science and engineering. What, what does it entail and, and why have you focused on that area? It's a, it's a long journey. So uh, it's uh, Bill Robinson was the director of DSIR uh, at the time when um, uh, Bob, and, uh, Bob Buckley and Jeff Tallon and the team discovered and patented one of the most commercial forms of high temperature superconductor. And, that, and the reason we're named after Bill, uh, uh, after, after Bill Robinson is because he was very much an engineer's engineer and a physicist who, who believed you must apply things and use them. And he actually set the team on a journey of, well, 
if it's important, what's it important for? Well, actually, it's about how do you go to use it, right? So this has been a rapid development of taking that technology, helping to turn it into mass commercialized product, taking it through to how do you make the coils and the machines that actually use that and then make a difference in the world? How do you make the whole system? And so we've specialized in driving that forward. So we have that niche in New Zealand and a whole range of industries and other partners around the country who are familiar with cryogenic systems now, who are familiar with making and selling magnets, who, who know how to do the cryocooled and the cooling systems. And that's actually, if you like, that was Bill Robinson's vision when he was back in the team to, to start taking it forward and going, which is seeing an outcome in New Zealand. And when you say, how far can it go? Well, Ratu's taken another big system approach to that technology and that applied superconductivity expertise in that sort of hub, I don't believe exists anywhere else in the world to be able to apply and use and do it, which is why we work so, so widely across the globe. How do you foster um, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs in, in that sort of environment? Because, you know, you've got science is one thing, but having, you know, the sort of Ratu drive to start a, uh, do a startup out of that, um, how, how do you foster that? Fan the flames that exist. Not everybody will be an entrepreneur, right? But those who show the first and are hungry and have ideas and are not frightened of failure, um, give them the opportunities. And so we try to um, make sure that all of our uh, staff and students interact directly with the commercial organisations that, that, that are relevant to them. For they understand about uh, deliverables, milestones, about how you do both business and academic presentations, about how you engage, how you work through, look at how you work um, go through a program and work out what, well, how do I estimate that? Dealing with uncertainty rather than certainty. So we, we try to instill those skills. We are um, unlike many other universities because we are part of Te Waka. We are the Paiho Robinson Research Institute in the Faculty of Engineering. And we don't, we, we immerse all of our research students, there's currently 36 are immersed with the world experts alongside them every day with full-time researchers. And that means that you encourage them to both be creative but work collaboratively in a team and work and, and engage with those organisations outside and work with them towards those milestones and deliverables. So it's about fanning those who show the flair. Some of them we send overseas to companies and organisations on that journey, don't we, Ratu? Well, that's a, that's a yeah. good p place to pick up. So that's what you actually did, Ratu? Yeah, so um, an example of that is I joined Robinson as a summer student um, just on a, on a scholarship. Um, and the big opportunity that they offered me after I, I think I did well on that summer scholarship um, was a placement at one of their commercial partners in the United States. So I went and did a six-month uh, six placement um, at a wire manufacturer, so a company actually making the kind of superconductor um, that I had been doing research on on my, on my summer. Um, and they had a research problem, um, you know, building experiments, trying to take measurements, trying to figure out what was going on with their wire that was on their kind of commercial critical path. They had sales lined up. The wire they were making was not meeting spec. They were burning 10 million US dollars um, a year trying to make that work. Um, and they could not figure out why their wire uh, wasn't uh, performing the way they expected. Um, and so that was kind of the pinnacle of, oh, okay, this thing that I'm doing matters. Um, it's solving a really cool problem. Um, and really gave me a taste of uh, not just for commercial aspects, but where superconductivity was as a process and a business um, compared to other industries that had come before it, such as the semiconductor industry. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to get those insights in a purely academic environment, um, being in a company environment and actually having commercial uh, mentorship while I was there um, was a huge part of my journey. 
So, you know, you're a smart guy. You could have done a lot of things. You could have gone and be an, a CEO of, of probably quite a few companies. What was it about wanting to do a startup yourself? What appeals to you about that? Um, that's, I, I think I have a pretty clear answer to that, which is I really, the entrepreneurial part of me, the way I kind of boiled it down to its essence was that I wanted to be able to work on a problem that I didn't think would be solved unless I worked on it. Now, that could have been a big problem or a small problem, but that was the flavour of thing. I didn't want to um, start a business for the sake of becoming super competitive with another business in a, in a market or a problem that had already been solved. Um, and clearly with baseload power generation um, that's clean and green, uh, that has not been solved. Um, but more importantly about the levitated dipole, is that it had this amazing body of work that had been done, and we just couldn't figure out reading it why it was stopped. Um, you know, from a motivational point of view, it should have kept going, um, but there were these technical hurdles that we thought we could solve, and so it, it matched that itch that I had as an entrepreneur perfectly. And part of the thing that kind of drove me to figure that out was the fact that I could have gone and worked on Fusion in general. I think there are Fusion um, much better funded fusion companies out there um, that I could have gone and uh, worked with. But the flip side of that is I didn't feel like I was going to be pushing the needle. I didn't think I was improving their chance of success, their chance of getting a shot on goal um, all that much. They were already attracting amazing talent. They're hiring out of Tesla and SpaceX. Um, you know, they're getting the best people uh, in the world already. I wasn't going to be the engineer who was going to push it over the line. Um, but for the levitated dipole, I felt like I could actually make that unique contribution. And I, I feel hugely privileged to be able to have that opportunity. Lauren, can I bring you in here? Um, from the Aspire um, Seed Fund's point of view, as an investor, what attracted you to this? And, and you, know, what, when you, you know, did you have that same sort of feeling like, gosh, this is really ambitious? Yeah, there's no denying the level of ambition Ratu has with OpenStar. Um, what particularly tracks us to a lot of our investments is that the companies are focused on extremely big challenges and extremely big markets and that they have founders and teams who are, are very motivated to see that challenge solved and have somewhat of a secret key to unlocking that challenge. And in, in OpenStar's case with Ratu's knowledge of the superconducting and the ability to leverage Robinson's expertise in the electronics to repurpose within the levitated dipole, that really brings the whole package together and demonstrates a credible solution that to be seen, but has viability in, in solving that problem. What support have you had, Ratu, so far that, that um, has been most helpful? I mean, what you know, it, it's a hard job being an entrepreneur, isn't it? So what's what's been the things that you have found, um, you know, within the ecosystem that's worked and what do you think, you know, um, could be added, I guess? I think... Once things start to go well, there's no shortage of that support. So once people start to get the taste of, yes, we want OpenStar to happen, they do really start throwing resources at you and the support and the confidence and, and to some extent the expectation. You know, they you know, go out there and expect you to go raise that round. Um, and so the overall ecosystem is really refreshing to know that there are players within that ecosystem who are really dedicated to the idea of success, the idea of ambition, you know, who didn't um, shy away from just how ambitious this problem uh, was uh, going to be um, and the difficulty that was going to be involved. Um, you know, frankly, when I set out to start OpenStar, I did not go out to raise the level of capital um, that I expect that we ended up raising. Um, I was more conservative. I thought that the ecosystem would want us to prove out some points, um, you know, some smaller points before we got into the big, um, the big things. But that, that realisation from, um, from the community and some mentors within it that, no, if you're going to prove yourself in the fusion domain, you can't start small in some extent. You have to think, what is the biggest bite of this apple that you can take off right now so that you can get the momentum uh, that you need. And when you go out there and continue fundraising that you take incredibly, um, that did not come from me. That, that was um, partly from the ecosystem itself and super important. Um, other than that, um, I, I should actually take a step back from OpenStar itself. 
Um, the support that probably mattered most to me um, didn't happen, um, oh, sorry, I should say the kind of traditional support and opportunities that the ecosystem can provide. Probably I took advantage of those before OpenStar itself. So an example of that is that uh, Auckland Uni Services runs the Return on Science Investment Committees, which are a part of their process for identifying technology coming out of the universities in New Zealand and putting them on a commercial pathway. It's part of our kind of pre-seed investment network. Um, and I was lucky enough to actually be a committee member on um, their Momentum and Physical Sciences Committees. And for me, that was an opportunity to you know be part of the ecosystem, but also see what it was like being on the other side of the table. So that before I went out and had to pitch my own ideas, I had already, A, seen a whole bunch of other people and kind of knew what the bar was, which is a little bit unfair, but it's not actually a competition. Um, but also just know what it's like once the entrepreneur leaves and the committee is there talking through what we've just heard, knowing what's said in those rooms, knowing the approach, knowing the, uh, the positive aspects and some of the more negative aspects of that. Um, that was a huge advantage that I had going into actually um, pitching something like OpenStar. And it was a really important part of um, the question you asked Rod before about how do you fan the flame of entrepreneurship? And there are those opportunities in the system. And I really hope that other people can continue to take those up and it helps them prepare for their own enterprises as well. So, um, Byron, NZGCP is obviously involved in, in helping support the system. What are the gaps you're seeing that, that need to be filled, do you think, to help founders like Ratu? I, I certainly think that ecosystem's developing quite quickly, and the University of Auckland has a pretty well-set-up program, partially by virtue of its size, in supporting both entrepreneurs and startups. KiwiNet's another initiative that runs across the majority of the rest of the country's universities and that does that on a more of a both startup founder support basis but also helping to bring research forward to the point where it may be investable or commercially applicable. And I think just doubling down onto the things that are working really is is what's needed. So continuing to support those entrepreneurs and to, to keep fanning the flame to use Rod's analogy. So you mentioned you've raised quite a bit of money, more than you thought you'd need, Ratu. Um, Byron, what's the environment like? Because everybody knows it's hard to raise capital, but everyone then goes on to say, but good or great companies get funded. So what's your view on the funding environment for a company like this that is going to be pretty capital intensive? Yeah, um, it's always hard to raise capital. I don't think anyone would ever say it's, it's easy, but it's certainly in the last 24 months gotten harder across the world. Um, if you look at other fusion-focused companies internationally, there's a handful that have raised already more than 500 million US dollars each, and none of them yet have a product that's ready to be sold. And I don't think there's any reason to think Ratu and OpenStar will need to raise any less than that, and certainly probably multitudes more. So there's no way that's going to come from New Zealand investors alone, and, and having international investors helping to bring companies on the journey is quite beneficial. The reality is OpenStar's technology won't only be used in New Zealand. And so having investors in those markets and who understand where it will be used and, and both from that geographical but also that expertise and power distribution, all of that's very beneficial to have alongside the company and supporting it. So does that mean the company needs to start talking to those international funders now? Because my understanding is it's good to get them sort of involved as you're hitting milestones and then they might invest rather than yeah. you know, um, waiting till you're ready almost. Yeah, and, and I think Raitu would be pretty open in saying he already is talking to international investors. Um, yeah. What's what's the um, feedback you've had like, Raitu? So the, the VC system is super inspiring in the sense that they want people to be taking big risks. Like Byron said, you want to be investing in companies that are trying to tackle huge markets. You know, to be frank, the people who populate this industry on the investment side um, are hyper, high-performance people in, them, in themselves. They could have had careers in whatever they wanted uh, um, in general, and they too are kind of obsessed with being able to find the thing that's going to change the world. It becomes a bit of a cliché. Um, and the really cool thing is, you know, this is a bit of imposter syndrome. Before you go out there, you do really wonder, oh, are they going to think the same way about me? <laughs> you know, are they going to take that same shine to OpenStar and think that we're um, really changing the world? Um, 
But the response there has been um, overwhelmingly positive. Um, you know, we're dis- in discussions with plenty of firms, not just uh, deep technical firms, but also generalist investors um, who know that opportunities come not just from B2B SaaS or AI, but, you know, can come from anywhere. Um, and it's often the uh, less expected places. Um, the other thing that we've kind of learned about that space is that <clears throat> there are some investors who are getting quite familiar with Fusion, um, who haven't just said, oh, we'll invest in one company, but they've actually generated a thesis. Some funds have raised, or some managers have raised dedicated funds to invest in Fusion companies, which also uh, bodes very well for, for our chances. Um, and so the appetite to be solving these problems and investing in companies like us um, is definitely there. And now we just actually need to do our real job, which is not the fundraising so much. It's actually to build the machines and hit the milestones. Um, if we do that, um, then it goes back to that old adage, which is that good companies can usually raise capital um, regardless of the market condition. So Rod, um, Robinson's obviously been involved in a number of spun out companies. Um, how, you know, from your experience, is funding an issue for those companies um, or what have you found? I think um, Ratu's positive experience that the market and the, and, and the venture market in New Zealand seems to have become a little bit more aware that actually they can take bigger risks. They don't say you wouldn't do that in New Zealand. And I think uh, that is that actually that actually goes back, I think, New Zealand learned a lesson with Peter Beck, right? So uh, I know I know people poo-pooed the idea when Peter first set up Rocket Lab, and um, but the investors saw it grow, and they saw how much growth because there was that technical base in New Zealand, and that it is about the people who are driving it and can do it, and that is also I think opportunities and where that is, is is open the eyes and but in a way where they assess the risks as well so it's not just do it blindly it's about saying well is there substance behind it is it does does this stack up and make sense and so i think actually in the last i would i would say in the last last five years really big time but uh, in the last 10 it started to become much more aware and uh, I think, you know, there's a hunger now amongst some of the young people. Some of the young people here, I'm, some of my staff, some of my finishing students, they're not going to be with me. They want to go off. They get inspired. They get inspired by the system is actually reinforcing, as in, you know, the, the financial system in the country and the investors and the people who have gone out there and do it. And actually, Ratu's become a role model for a lot of them now. And they want to go off. Not all of them want to do a big, one of the huge, massive challenges like Ratu, right? You can't think of anything bigger to go for, right? No but, pressure. <laughs> but but they, are, they are saying, I want to go and do. I want to make this work because this will change that whole area here. It's a real solution and they're, they're thinking about it and they want to go off and do it. So I think that's great. And that's because things are starting to align in this country that actually support those people. They recognise, they become a little bit more understanding of the risk and it's not about a three year return, right? It's about understanding how it plays into the bigger picture and then what happens. So it's making life for me at the Institute harder <laughs> right it's it, it's uh in, universities don't pay top salaries yeah uh and those so we can only train them encourage them and wave them on their journey where they go on and make the country rich <laughs> right i wanted to talk about inspiration rati um you're of Maori descent and your grandmother, Dame Katarina Matara, received her knighthood for helping save um, Te Reo from extinction. How much of an um, inspiration is, sh- is she to you and what you're attempting to do now? Is, is that something that you think about? Uh, it is something I think about. It's, um, as an inspiration, it's the, the way it probably affects me most is it really sets the bar high. Right. So people are really impressed with fusion, but like technology really is more about people, which is a theme that Rod's been covering quite a bit here as well. And uh, saving a language from extinction is a 
like the definition of a hard people problem. It was also the definition of a very defeatist situation. So that when um, my grandmother was effectively tasked by her supervisor to solve this, uh, it was because the government had just produced a report that basically concluded that, statistically speaking, the number of fluent um, and natural speakers of Māori had decreased to the point um, that it was going to go extinct, right? The numbers just were clear. The situation had played out in other languages around the world, and we were watching it happen uh, to, to te reo. Um, my grandmother just, you know, well, her supervisor uh, looked at her and said, what are you going to do about it, right? It's just that pure call to action, the challenge and the responsibility that you put on people. Um, and so I, I don't consider the challenges of like a different, um, different scale or difficulty, actually. I would be just as daunted um, trying to pull off something like that in the face of um, what the situation was. Um, and so that sets the bar, you know, what's my excuse for backing away from, you know, an opportunity like that to solve a problem like that and positively affect people's lives? Um, you know, what my requirement or my, you know, what I was looking for as an entrepreneur wasn't necessarily the scale. I would have been quite happy solving a problem no one else could solve or no one else was going to solve, um, even if it was a smaller problem. Um, it just so happened that the situation I found myself in, the problem was this fusion thing, and then the responsibility piece was so high that on, how on earth would I back away from that? And so when, time, when it gets tough, and it definitely does, um, that is an important part of my thinking. Um, I did not go into this thinking it would be fun or like a joy ride. Um, what I knew I was signing myself up for was a pretty brutal um, journey uh, to get this thing done and the, the, the lows would be as equally low as the highs are high um, and so that responsibility piece um, was yeah super important. Have you had any particular support as a Maori founder? There we have um, Naitahu as an investor which is um, fantastic to have him on the team. To be honest um, I think it needs to flow the other way. I'm actually much more interested in how I can support Māori Dim and other Māori founders and um, that side of the economy and really push the level of ambition. Um, you know, the way I like to think of it is that um, Polynesia used to be the largest geographically extended empire on earth, right? That's what um, our culture used to be. Um, and again, it's that level of ambition that you can take to these things. Um, and I actually just think we need to remember that. Um, and if I can play some role in that, I'd be um, super happy to. Um, but, yeah. So just touching on Tahu as an investor, do you think um, that the uh, iwi values align with your own? There's, there's this funny thing when you start a startup and – the VC ecosystem is very used to this thing where founders will turn up with friends and family investors. So they went to their parents and they went to their rich uncle and they raised a little bit of capital so that they could get started in their garage. Um, I think for me, um, I'm not of uh, Naitahu descent myself, um, but broadly speaking, you know, um, my connection to um, Maridam and my sense of responsibility there meant that I really wanted to make sure that I had representation on board. Um, but for me, it was like the more appropriate version of that kind of friends and family um, investors, right? Like, it's not just my journey. Um, it's what level do I consider those associations? Is it just the immediate family I grew up with? Is it just get my cousins in for a couple of grand each and they can come along for the ride? Or is it making sure that there are... Um, iwi who have invested um, and will see financial returns from this as well. Um, unfortunately, I think that um, my own iwi are in a pretty uh, tough spot um, at the moment, given some of the natural disasters that have happened around the country last year. Um, and that's what they've really knuckled down to think about. And to be honest, that just increases my resolve that climate change um, is the problem we need to be solving. Um, but unfortunately, for uh, for my people, it's probably immediately needs to be about climate resiliency um, and not so much about avoidance of 
um, the issues because that is a truly global problem. Uh, it's not something that I can put on the uh, shoulders of Ngāti Kahunu uh, to solve. So, Mar- Byron, um, as an investor, you know, you're one of a group of investors, obviously. How, what sort of milestones do you look for? And, and Rod has talked about hitting milestones. What, what are you looking for? And, you know, you know, how do you judge whether things are going okay? Uh, that tends to be the result of a lot of back and forth discussion between investors and companies as to what the most important milestones to be hitting are. And so when a company raises capital, they'll often come with a, um, a plan of what they intend to achieve with the money. And part of doing that due diligence into the investment is understanding which of these milestones are actually the take away the key risks and sort of embody that fail fast attitude versus our um, are nice to do with if with money if it's available. So you've obviously got a widespread portfolio with a company like um, OpenStar. How much input do you actually have in in, in, in sort of talking with those um, with the company founders and, and the team? Specifically with OpenStar, we're quite a small shareholder, um, and so a lot of our discussions with Ratu and the team tend to be catching up where they're at against their milestones and, and understanding what they expect to achieve next what those future capital raises look like and, and how we can be helpful in the interim. With the companies where we're one of the bigger shareholders, we tend to be a lot more hands-on and, and get in there and do a bit of work alongside the teams themselves. And and that's something our team's exploring, how we can do that more across the board because we we fully appreciate that that's what makes a, a investor valuable to its portfolio companies. So, Rana, which of your investors do you um, sort of, I guess, um, interact with most? Who has the most say? <laughs> Almost certainly Outset Ventures. And so that's largely because they led the seed round, but they didn't lead it with the Lazarus check. The reason why Outset led it was because they had the technical, I, I mean, they weren't experts in fusion, but they are the, I would say, kind of premier deep tech um, investor um, in the country. They're very highly tuned to the level of ambition that you want to be pushing for in deep tech. Um, and frankly, they, they really won me over um, by putting me in front of Peter Beck as part of the due diligence process. So I think it would have been my first proper pitch pitch to Outset Ventures was uh, to Pete. And their process was, can this kid survive interrogation from New Zealand's most successful um, technology entrepreneur? Um, and that means that they built up not just that conviction, but that understanding from the start and made sure that they maintained and built that and became a thought partner on the way through. So Angus Blair sits as our investor director on the board alongside myself um, and is taking a pretty active part in helping us build OpenStar, um, in, in particular in thinking through and managing the um, capital formation execution um, side of the, of the, of the business. Um, but then the other thing to be said is that um, they'll always take the view that they can provide governance and oversight and help me think through things, um, but they invest in companies because the founders understand the problem the best. And so they just need to make sure that they can play a role in helping founders and um, company builders actually move forward. Um, but they're not trying to uh, tell us, um, you know, what we're going to be doing on a month-to-month basis, but they absolutely help us think through what the milestones should be and that, that kind of thing. So Rod talked about you being a role model to others. How, how much pressure does that place on you? How do you deal with that pressure and the pressures of being an entrepreneur? I mean, it's, it is a hard slog. How, how, do you, how do you wind down? How do you sort of cope with that? Um, for me personally, um, the strange thing is that um, we've hired an open star. We tend towards hiring people who are very extreme in some aspect of their life. So there are a lot of um, athletes um, to just ridiculous degrees. Some people with very high risk tolerance in physical domains. Um, I've had pretty serious project delays because people broke bones coming off mountain bikes, that kind of stuff. Uh, super frustrating, nearly banned it. But the ironic thing about me is I'm kind of the opposite. Um, I All of my risk tolerance in life seems to be prof- professional. I've always been willing to put myself out there in a professional setting, um, whether or not while I was a student or in my PhD or when I was publishing papers. Um, I'm very happy to rock the boat. Um, And that the ironic thing about making sure I don't implode as as a human being is that I just need to take care of my physical health 
um, primarily. So as long as I'm uh, getting enough sleep, so I'm other than this week, um, I've been very diligent about going to bed at basically 9.30, um, actually getting a solid eight hours, and then um, more often than not making it to the gym um, to keep myself in good shape. And I'm trying to get into better and better shape. Um, that's how I avoid it, uh, avoid the implosion. If I don't get enough exercise for about three days in a row, I can feel it. I, you know, all that pressure people think I should be under it is right there in my face. And I wonder how on earth am I going to get through today without people looking at me and going, oh my God, this is all over because the founder, you know, is, is crumpling. Um, and then I go to the gym and it's fine. Um, so I just, that's how I take care of myself. Um, downtime is not, has never been very effective for me. Um, is probably something else to add. He's missing part of his role model isn't just to young people, right? So he's dodging there. I was talking to uh, some of the other people yesterday um, who ran LDX, and they were having conversations. They're saying, oh, this is fantastic, what, what Ratu is doing and uh, what he's doing. And, and it's sort of like he's become a role model as well to... Some of the people in the most, the largest energy companies in the world and some of those people who did that original work he's based on are just saying, oh, this is fantastic. So, you know, how does he, how does he, how does he deal with being a role model to that generation older than you, not just your generation? Uh, I'll admit I'm actually reasonably awkward about that still. <laughs> um, it's... Uh, there are probably some personal interactions I've had that were really impactful on me, but they're quite personal to the other people involved, and so I can't can't save them. But there have definitely been some moments where I've just gone, holy shit, this is the level of commitment that you're seeing in this opportunity, and you're looking at me because, you know, this exists because I had a kooky idea in my basement one time. Um, that, that still is a bit bit jarring um, but then I kind of just think to myself this is my job um, it's not just a nice thing it's not like being you know famous it's actually um, my job to work with these people and help them do their best work and give them the best opportunities to contribute and so I just think to myself this is my job I'll play the role this is all good yes they have like 30 years experience on me um, but that's all right apparently I have something to offer can we just finish on, um, if everything goes right and you meet your milestones, what's that pathway to us seeing this first fusion reactor built? What's the timeline and, 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 you know, what do you have to achieve? Yeah, so there's probably a couple of ways to look at it. One is that the MVP, the minimum viable product for fusion, is quite likely not a power plant. Um, we want to get to a fusion machine that has commercial relevance that people will pay us to build because that means we can use that revenue to iterate the machines and continue improving their performance. And you can get to that threshold well before you uh, get to this kind of more energy out than in threshold that has plagued fusion for so long. Um, so we think that machine is within the next um, five to six years of work. We'll be able to get to that unit and then start rolling those out. Um, then the journey to actually get to power plants um, is within the 10, you know, from now, probably, you know, uh, nine to 10 years. Um, and to be frank, that's just the beginning, right? You think about it, that, that moment where you sell the first power plant and you turn it on is only, you've probably built, you know, in total four or five really impressive devices at that point, increasing in scale. But once you sell that first one where they bought it to, for electricity, the thing that lies in front, of you, in front of you after that is thousands of power plants, right? You have barely begun the actual work um, of solving the problem that we're running up against. Um, but as an enterprise, you've now got past that point where you're hoping to um, for dear life that you don't have to sell you know, most of the company just to raise the next amount of money that you need. Um, and so at that point, OpenStar will have its own life um, and maybe I don't need to be the CEO who you know, drives out a thousand power plants, um, but I really want to get it to that stage. And I think those are the timeframes that we'll be able to achieve that on. Well, sounds like a good note to wrap it up. Thanks very much for your time, gentlemen. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 
Thanks for listening to the second episode of the Caffeine Podcast series, Seed to Success. I want to thank Ratu Matara, Professor Rod Badcock and Byron Van Voot, and also thank the listeners out there, and of course special thanks to NZGCP for sponsoring this podcast. Look out for the third episode in this series. I'm Caffeine Editor Fiona Rotherham. Matewa.